cambiar el orden de la alabanza, así que le invito a que cierre sus ojos y levante sus manos.
Amen. Amen. We want to come for God in prayer. This uh, the, um, the guitar. This uh, morning, I want to pray for for uh, for the surrounding churches. I want to pray for Riverside, Rialto, San Bernardino. Amen. All right, there we go. Riverside, Rialto, San Bernardino. I want to pray for uh, for the all the events that's taking place this past uh, month for the rally that was in Peru, for the souls that were saved, for the for the big event they just did in Italy. At the, at the uh, Italy churches, want to pray that God will just continue to help those that gave their lives to God. Amen. want to pray this morning. I just got, uh, like, right now during song service, I got a message. Actually, an old friend of mine, Pastor uh, Juan Campos. I've known him since the mid-90s. Uh, we, were, we were going up in the ministry together. Uh, I just got a message that he went to be with the Lord, I guess, last night. <clears throat> so I want to pray for his family. I want to pray for his wife, his church, and that God will just be with them. Amen. That God, that God will help them. We know where he's at. Amen. He was a soldier for God. So I just want to pray that God will be with them. I want to pray, amen, for for our church, that God will continue to help us for the upcoming uh, um, outreach we're doing in San Bernardino, for their, our sister church in San Bernardino. I want to pray for that. And for what we're doing next month, amen, we're doing our event where the churches are coming over here to help us. So I want to pray for that um, and uh, that God will just help us. Uh, and for some marriages that are going to be taking place here in the next month or so, uh, that God will just be with them. That God will help them. That God will strengthen them. That God will just uh, continue to part of spirit and be glorified, amen. How many this morning, you got a, you got a need in your life, amen. There's something going on in your life. You need a need. There's something, you know what, uh, sometimes we go through things that's spiritual, it's emotional financial you know sometimes we're dealing we're dealing with pains and hurts that we've pushed aside but you know what to this this uh this morning amen you can trust in god you can believe in god you can allow god amen to be the lord of your life you can allow him amen to 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 help you this morning many times we, we hang on to these things and, and and by hanging on to them we're not giving god the opportunity to help us amen this morning, man, I challenge you to just drop them, amen. Allow God to just help you this morning. So, you know, let's cry to God. Let's worship God. And uh, let's ask God to just uh, pour his, his blessing upon this service, upon their needs, and just help us, amen. And uh, let's worship God, amen. And I'd like to ask you, man, our brother Angel can open us up in prayer, man. So let's worship God, amen, as our brother opens us up in prayer. Hallelujah. I praise God. I worship you, Lord. Glorify your God. I thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we worship you, God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Father God, we'd like to thank you as we allow us to gather in your house once again this morning, Lord. We ask that you open up our hearts to the word we're about to receive. We ask that you bless the word that Pastor Ben is about to give us. We ask that you keep your hand upon our families, our loved ones, uh, any needs that they may have, uh, whether it be for healing, financial, whatever it is, God, we know that you have your hand upon it. And we ask that you keep our family and our loved ones safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You took time to greet someone this morning. Amen. 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 This morning, we got some announcements. Just want to remind you of our regular services every Sunday morning at 10. Every Wednesday at 7. Amen. Um, right now, we're doing uh, Spanish uh, music because we've been blessed <coughs> with uh, Sister Ashley from the Ensenada Church. And uh, and so down there, they do all, of course, all Spanish. But uh, 
I'm gonna see if we can uh, practice. Maybe I'll bring out my bass guitar. We'll play together and do some some English Spanish songs or some bilingual songs. Hopefully, she's we got her for a month, hey amen. So I have a month to try to figure out a way to keep her, and uh, and uh, but we're gonna mix it up a little bit. So, hey amen. So we're it, it's good, hey amen. We're trying to get the words on the screen so we can be be ready, hey amen. Um, uh, next week, not this week. Next week is the is the North Mexico conference in Tijuana, hey amen. We are going on uh, on uh, Thursday. And coming back Friday, we're going Thursday early morning. We will be there for the morning services. They start at 9 a.m. And then uh, then we'll be there for the evening service at 7. I want to encourage you, if you, if you can make it, uh, go be a part of it and and uh, and see what God's doing in the other countries, amen. It's it's really good. You know, we're blessed to have Mexico so close to us, amen, because you can actually see when you go across, it's like going to... You know, an overseas work, amen. And it's just and it's just a, a short drive down down to Tijuana. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Go go see what God's doing. If you can make it, let me know. If you uh, we're going to be down there for Thursday, Friday. So if you can only go during the day or something, um, and want to park on this side and walk across, so let me know. Uh, we can we can pick you up at the at the border. We'll make it we'll make it happen, amen. So you can we'll make it as easy as possible for you, amen. Um, uh, next Saturday, amen, uh, uh, no, oh, I'm sorry, on the 22nd, two Saturdays, amen, they're going to have the, the, the Inland Empire, uh, summer explosion outreach for San Bernardino, we've already did, uh, Riverside and Rialto, this is San Bernardino, these are our sister churches, amen, so we're going to go over there, we were with the pastor last night, and they're excited, so we want to, uh, we want to, be prepared for that make make uh make time in your schedule that uh on the 22nd uh that saturday we will be over there we will be ministering we'll be passing out flyers we'll be letting people know about god getting people saved amen and then on august 12th we will be here in our city doing something also amen uh and don't forget this is all leading up to our taking the land rally 2023 Inland empire rally uh september 15th and 16th amen it's a friday and saturday um it's going to be here in, in the city of Riverside. Uh, we're co-hosting it with the four surrounding churches, Riverside, Rialto, San Bernardino, amen, and us, amen. So we want to we want to um, be a part of that, make sure that we're, we're faithful to these things. And, oh, the raffle is going on today, amen, for the, for the doggy, amen. Amen. These are the announcements, amen. We're going to an offer, amen. Let's worship God as worship us forward. Amen. This morning, amen, you give with an open heart. Amen. You know what the Bible says, that that you know what to be faithful with your tithes and your offerings. Allow God to bless your finances. You know, I say this all the time. We give God our, 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 our spouse. We give God our kids. We give God our jobs. Amen. The only thing we don't give God is our finances. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's trust God in all areas of our life. Allow God, amen, to just uh, bless you this, this morning. Amen. And uh, let's borrow hearts. And don't forget, you can give in the basket. You can also give online on, using the Zell app at ndgive at, ndgive at gmail.com. Amen. So uh, let's borrow hearts, amen, as we bless the gift from the giver. Go ahead. Father God, we ask that you bless the uh, these tithes and offerings this morning, God. We ask that you bless those that continue to give faithfully and continue to uh, put our add, add to our kingdom in heaven. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, moon and at the door. What a mighty God we serve. Angel. I forgot. Amen.
Amen. This this uh, this morning, what I'm going to preach is almost a continuation of our Bible study on on Wednesday. We're going to get into the same types of the same types of things, but uh, I think it's important that we we go through this because we need to understand the importance of living a clean life for God. You know, Jesus Christ has done so much for us. So it's important to understand when you live a clean life for God. And, and, and when you come to church, you'll understand, you'll hear it a lot. And I'm going to try to break it down for us to give you a little bit, make a little bit more, give a little bit more clarity. But we live, we live in a spiritual world. We, we see the physical elements of life. We see everything physical, the buildings, the people, we see all that stuff. And it's easy to get caught up in those things and the materialistic things, and it's easy to get caught up in that kind of stuff. But we, we as Christians, we as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we are living in a spiritual world. So you got to understand that there is a war going on right now. There's a battle. The battle, there's a, there's a spiritual war that's taking place right now for you. It's like any other war that's out there. There, there's there's a prize there's there's a goal there's 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 an agenda there's something that want that that the enemy wants to do whenever whenever right now Russia invaded uh, Ukraine uh, was it, what, Ukraine and and what's the goal Russia wants the property back right They're, that's the goal they want they want to they want to take back the land they want to inherit that land they want that so there's a spiritual war going on right now with your life. And in this spiritual war, the enemy wants to do the same thing. It wants to take back the land. But the land in this case, amen, the enemy is, is the devil. And what he wants to do is he wants to take you back. He wants to possess you. He wants you to be part of his life. <clears throat> the, the winner of this war is going to get your soul. The problem that we have today is not always that the fight that we're having... That the fight we're having is with the devil. But the problem today isn't so much the devil. The problem is today is ourselves. A lot of times we fight ourselves on things that we should be doing. We, we're, 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 we could become our biggest enemy. We have, we have a, lot of, a lot of things coming at us spiritually. But many times we know what to do, but we fail to do it. We know we shouldn't do this. We know we shouldn't go to the left, but we go to the left and we should be going to the right. We know we should be walking straight, but we walk backwards. And we do all these things. If you walk backwards enough, far enough, you're going to trip and fall. And this is what we do. And we do this because this is what we decide to do many times. And a lot of times we, we, we give the devil so much credit that the devil, there's an old picture, and I mentioned this a while back. There's a picture of the devil sitting on a curb out front outside of a church crying. And they asked him why, and he says, well, because everybody inside that building keeps blaming me for everything, and I didn't do it all. And, and, and we can blame the devil for everything. But understand this, there is a battle. There is a war. So the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Matthew, chapter 16, beginning of verse 24, Matthew 16, 24 to 26, it says this. <clears throat> then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone, you hear me say this all the time, the word if, two letter word with a lot of meaning because it requires you to do something. It says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. These are the words of Christ. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will it take for you to give up the salvation that God is giving you today. What will it take today? What is the price? What is it out? What is it that that the world has to offer? 
What is it that the devil has to offer? What is it that, that you don't believe God has given you that's worth giving up your salvation? So your salvation is what Jesus Christ did on the cross for. Your salvation is the very thing, amen, that gives us the inheritance of heaven, that makes us a citizen of heaven. So the salvation is the very thing that that, that God thought was so precious that he, that he had to send his son to die for us. And that was the thing we receive when we accept Jesus Christ. So, so what is it today that is so important that you're willing to sell your salvation for? Jesus knew this was a real factor in life for, uh, of, of those who followed him. This is, why, this is why Jesus says, what will the man give in exchange for his soul? And it sounds so much more deeper when he said it when he said in those. What will you give in exchange for your soul? What's What's worth your soul? We did we did a Bible study on music and 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 and, and the spiritual uh, elements of music, and and I, and I discussed a man about a musician that the story tells that he gave up his soul to the devil in exchange for the talent to play music. To him, the the, the music the musical talent, a man, was was worth the value of his soul. What's the worth the value of your soul today? What is it that you're say, that you're going to turn around and say, you know what? I would rather have this than the kingdom of heaven. What, what would you say that this is more important to me than what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross? What is it today? Because there's a lot of things that we go through in life, a lot of things that we have to deal with that that we don't we don't we don't ever want to say it that way. We'll never come out and say, well, you know what? I'm just going to just give up my soul for this because we know that sounds silly. But the reality is. When we live our lives, there's a lot of things that we we know. See, the issue is uh, the entire concept is 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 simple. The whole thing comes down to a possession. So, who possesses your soul today? Who possesses your soul today? I'm talking about if you have without a shadow of a doubt. Because let me tell you, people say, "Well, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to heaven." Okay, well, that's good. I'm glad. But the Bible, but the Bible is clear about it. The Bible says, unless a man is born again, you cannot, you shall not, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's what the Bible says, and it's up to you if you decide if you want to believe what the Bible says. It says, unless you are born again. So we can say, well, I'm making it to heaven. And everybody, you know, I've done a lot of funerals, and and and, and you guys know I'm I'm uh, there's a mortuary in Ontario that calls me up and I'll I'll do go down there and do funerals for people. And everybody always wants the, the comfort that, that their loved one made it to heaven. But the reality is, amen, the Bible says, unless you're born again. See, religious beliefs have nothing to do with making it to heaven. Religious beliefs are just religious, religious beliefs. We can't say, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm going to make it to heaven because the devil believed in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the demons in hell all tremble at his name. So does that mean they make it to heaven? No, they've already been casted out. So, so, so. When I say who possesses your soul, I mean, what I'm asking is, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And are you doing everything in your best effort to live for God to say, God, I have surrendered to you. I have given myself to you, God. And is, is heaven going to be your home today? I just mentioned, I just, I just got, I literally just got word that an old friend of mine just went to be with the Lord. And I say it that way because I know he was a soldier for God. I know he was living for God. Where are we at today? Who possesses our soul? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. <clears throat> Paul writes, and he says, Paul says, remember, when Paul writes, he's writing these letters to actual churches. So the book of Galatians, he was writing a letter to the church in, in, in Galatia, Galatians, or the citizens of Galatia, okay? So he's writing to the people in the church. So when he writes, he's talking about things that are actually going on in church. People will come to church and be like, why do you always talk about sin? Why? Well, it's because this is what goes on in real life. And this is what Paul knew. So when Paul's writing to the church in Galatia, he says in uh, Galatians 5, 16 to 21, it says, and then I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill 
the lust of the flesh. Uh, for the for the flesh lusts against the spirit. What's the flesh? It's us, our body, our souls, our, our regular our human nature. And the spirit against the flesh. <clears throat> and these are contrary to one another. That means that your, 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 your flesh and the spirit of God, they're enemies. They, they're always wanting something different. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Listen to this. The works of the flesh are evident. The works of the flesh are evident. What is the flesh? It's your human nature. It's who you are. It's what we are, what we're fighting against. It's, it's the thing that makes us want to do something that we know we shouldn't be doing. Okay. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, or like heated disagreements, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, south ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, not just physical murders, but also spiritual murders. You know we can spiritually kill people? Drunkenness, revelries, and, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things. Now listen, this is not Pastor Van just coming out and saying this is what, this is what it is. Paul says... And those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's writing this to the church. Why do you think Paul's telling the church, hey, you know what? The kingdom of heaven is without jealousies, without hatred. Because these are the things that were going on in church. He's saying, he's saying there's no adultery in church. You can't, you can't be committing adultery. You can't be fornicating in church. He's saying these are the things that, 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 that you cannot do while you're in church. You can't do this and serve God. He says, and he ends it with, he says, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I'm a good person. I hear people say that all the time. I'm a good person. Well, you know what? There, there's a lot of good people that never made it to heaven. But there's a lot of people who repented and did. And it's not about whether you, whether you judge yourself as a good person or not a good person. What matters is, are we living for God? Have we accepted Jesus Christ as our own personal Lord and Savior? See, these are things that kept us from serving God. These are things that kept me from even coming to church before, before I gave my life to God. But when we give our life to God, we put these things aside. We learn to put away the things that would hold us down. See, Paul says the works of the devil are evident. The works of the devil are evident. He uses the word evident because to be evident means to be clear or visible. Right? Clearly visible or unhidden. Something that is obvious and clear. So when he says that the works that the works of the devil are evident, he says that it's not hidden. It's not something we don't know. Or it's our human nature to understand right from wrong. You know, there's, there's, it's within us. It's like the laws of God, amen, or the Ten Commandments were instilled and in, in embedded into our hearts when we were born. Because when we grow up, we understand right and wrong. We understand good and evil. We do understand that as we grow up. As we get older, we decide what we want to do with it. That's why Paul says that, th that these things are evident, that these things are reality. These things are clear. They're seen. They're visible. They're, it's, it's understandable. You can't say you don't know. That's what Paul's saying. So this stuff is simple. It's very simple. He says the works of the devil are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self-ambitious. Envy, murders, drunkenness. He says these are evidence. This is evident. We know that these things are wrong. We understand that these things are wrong. But yet Paul's still writing to the church and saying, hey, let's, let's, let's not do these things. Sometimes we need reminders. See, the works of the devils are clear and visible. They're evident. They're unhidden. They're obvious. They're easy to see. To remove these things is, is only hard in the beginning. You know, when you first give your life to God, all these things are, are hard in the beginning. How do you stop doing that? Because we've got to make decisions. You know, 
You know, when, when a person wants to do something and they know it's wrong, and I've heard these, I've had these conversations with people for years. They know it's wrong. And remember, I have adult children that's older than some, most of you in here. And they know it's wrong, but they give 101 reasons why it sounds like it's good. They know it's wrong. You tell them it's wrong, they ask you, they'll ask you point blank. People will ask me point blank, Pastor, do you think this? And I said, is this right or is this wrong? And I'll tell them. Are you sure you're asking me? You want me to tell you? Yeah, Pastor, I want you to tell me. Okay, I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't going to like what I'm going to tell you. And I tell them, no, that is wrong. That is sin. That needs to be removed. But what about it? Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, come on with the whatabouts. The whatabouts, amen, is your justification to do it. It's making yourself feel good. That's why it says self-ambitions. You know, there's stuff within us that we want to do good and we do things. But 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 I love her, but I love him. But you don't understand. No, 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 I understand. That's your self-ambition telling you this is what I want. But God's saying there's so much more. You guys just got to be sad. But, 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 but you don't understand. I, I, I only do this a little bit. I only do that a little bit. I don't do that that much. Well, God says, that's fine. Paul writes and he says, but if you do it, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You just can't. But that's so harsh, Pastor. Well, my job isn't to make it easy. My job is just to read what is in the Bible. I'm not just reading what's in the Bible. These are the things that I have to live through. See, living for God is so much more than, than an attendance record of going to church. You know, when you when you keep it, when you when you show up to church all the time, what you've done is you, you you've shown some some time management skills. And it's good to have time management skills. If you have a job, you gotta have time management skills. At my job, everybody who works for me, they have to have time management skills. If they can't, then they're gonna get caught doing something they shouldn't be doing. And they ain't gonna have a job anymore. So but they got good time management skills, now they'll be successful. Coming to church. Hey, good time management skills. I'm faithful. I come. I hear. I listen. I just don't do it. What's the purpose? You made it this far. You 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 got up this morning. You took a bath. Amen. It probably took you all week to get into that shower. You put your teeth in. Amen. You showed up to church. And you get here. You sit down. You get to listen to this big, dark, bald guy tell you all the things you shouldn't do. Wouldn't it make sense to just like, hey, maybe I should like do some of that? You already put in the work. The hard part's done. You made it. You know what the hardest thing about serving God is? Getting to church. That's the hardest thing. The hardest thing about getting people saved is to get them in the building. Most people want want to accept Jesus Christ. You tell somebody, hey, would you like to accept Jesus Christ? Can I pray with you? You know, just just a simple prayer of salvation to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You know, most people say, yeah. Well, we'll tell you, yeah. Why wouldn't they? They tell you, yeah, of course. Unless they're Satan. They usually say, yeah. I, I, I've done it thousands of times. You know, mind if I pray with you real quick? Yeah, go ahead. People always want prayer. Yeah, yeah, come pray with me. You know what? Before I pray for you, I want to pray with you. Why don't you say these words after me? And get them to accept Jesus Christ. And they'll do that all day long. I can walk down the street and go get 20 people saved right now. But getting them in the building and living for God. That's the hard part. So you guys already did the hard part. You've accepted Jesus Christ and you came to the church. That's the hardest part. I had somebody tell me a while back, another pastor, a senior pastor, tells me, he goes, Ben, how many people in your church? And I go, I don't know. At the time, I said, I don't know, maybe about 20 people. He goes, no, 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 no. How many people, if you were to ask them where the church was at, they would say your church. They've been to your church. They just ain't coming. I go, on that case, I don't know, what, 70, 80, somewhere on there. They just don't know. He goes, well, that's your church. Because that's your church. You have 80 people in your church. So well, I don't see them. I open up the doors and they don't come. You know, so I get empty seats. And he goes, yeah, that's the hard part. He, just, he goes, they're already, they're, they're already, that's your, that's their church. You just got to get them through the door. See, you already did the hard part. You showed up. 
So Paul says all these things are, 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 are clear. It's evident. It's not hidden. We know right from wrong. We see things that are obvious and, and clear. We understand. In Galatians 5.22, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. <clears throat> Galatians 5.22. It says, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. That means not giving up. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And here's a good one. Self-control. Against such there is no law. What that means is living with these cannot be argued against, okay? People can't, can't come against this stuff. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions, with its passions and desires. And if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If you live in the spirit, how many people, are, man, I have met some really spiritual people who live like devils. Man, they they will sit there and they will they can quote the Bible. They can I am I can quote the Bible, but if you ask me the name of the book, chapter, verse, I'm I, okay, now you're asking too much. Let me go look for you. I, my mind just doesn't work that I tell everybody all the time, my head is big, but my brain is small. I can't do it. I try. There's a few scriptures that I have done that with, but there's not very many. But I can't quote scripture. I know a lot of scripture. Some people come and, and they can they can just quote scripture. You can go to a bar and have a talk with a guy who's drunk at the bar, who's there every single day, and he can tell you how spiritual he is. He can tell you. He can give you scripture. And he can tell you about God. And he's there's some really good people out there who live good lives but never make it to heaven because they're just good people. They never, they're not spiritual people, but they act spiritual, but they don't walk in the spirit. Paul says for us to not just not just be spiritual, but be crucified to the flesh and its passions and its desires. And don't just say we're spiritual, but let's also walk in the spirit. So when he says that the fruits of the spirits are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When he says all these things, he says, why don't we walk that way too? Why don't we walk in a little bit of self-control? Why don't we walk in a little bit of kindness? You know what? You imagine how it would be if you just walked in a little bit of kindness to somebody and a little bit of love, a little bit of long suffering. You know, being long suffering requires patience and understanding. Being willing to just continue to move forward. Yeah, it's going to take a while, but I'm just going to move forward. Imagine how much better it can be if we just we could just walk in the spirit of some of these things and live the life that God has called us to. Do. But the problem is not really getting rid of these things in our lives because we understand they are ruining our lives anyways but for many of us it is allowing their counterpart to come in that's the hard part for us we can get rid of adultery and, and fornication we can get rid of that stuff we can get rid of of living unclean or idolatry we can get rid of we can get rid of, of sorcery or, or witchcraft we can get rid of that we can get rid of jealousy and hatred right but it's not so much getting rid of that because we understand that envy and murder and drunkenness will kill us and send us down. We understand that. The hard part isn't getting rid of that stuff. The hard part is replacing it with the fruits of the Spirit. It, it's hard to, to replace it with love because you don't always want to love people. The, the hard part is replacing it with joy because you don't know the kind of life I've lived. The hard part is replacing it with peace, but you don't know how much these people get on my nerves. That's the hard part. It's the hard part is, is replacing them. The hard part is kindness because you know what? People are just mean. The hard part is long suffering. You don't understand the patience I've had to deal with. The long part, the hard part is faithfulness, but you don't understand that what I have to do with my life. You don't understand my life. Why do I have to be there? The hard part is, is, is allowing gentleness, speaking to people with respect. The hard part is, is, is bringing in some self-control. That's the hard part. 
Getting rid of the fornication, adultery, drunkenness. Oh, that's easy. That's easy. We know that that's ruining their life anyways. People people will do those things and they, they, they get rid of it eventually. When I, when I came to church, I used to steal cars. I used to sell drugs. I used to get drunk. I used to fight. When I came to church, getting rid of those things were easy. Because I knew that getting fighting all the time was bad. Anybody could tell you that. It's it's evident, right? Paul said it's evident. Selling drugs, I knew was bad, right? It was evident. Right? These things I knew were evident. Stealing cars, I knew that was wrong, right? If I didn't know it was wrong, I wouldn't have been running from the police. I knew it was wrong. That was easy to get rid of. The hard part was the people that would want to beat up, I had to learn to love those people. That was the hard part. I can deal with not, not beating up and knocking them out. My hard part was trying to figure out a way to love them so I could bring them to church. Now, that was the hard part. You see, it's easy to get rid of the stuff. We can get rid of the stuff because we know it's bad for us. We know. We, we understand this. We, we're born with the, with the moral compass and understand right from wrong. It, it, it's something that's, that's been embedded. It's something God stamped into our hearts. It's something that we know. But to replace it, and this, is the, and this is the big obstacles we as Christians have, is replacing it. We Christians like to say things like, yeah, but I'm saying the truth, right? I'm not lying. They are stupid. They are dumb. What's the truth? I'm not lying. If they weren't, if they weren't so, I wouldn't. No, 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 no. We've got to replace that. How can I help you? Let me show you. You know, can I help you? How can we replace it? See, it's easy It's easy to get rid of this stuff, but it's hard to replace it. So living with the truth of the Spirit does not only deal with you, but it allows those around you to be affected. The fruits of the Spirit gets us to die to self and pour into someone else. When you, when, when, before we give our lives to God, we are a certain person. But as you begin to live for God and begin to replace all these bad attributes with, with, the, with the fruits of the Spirit, you know that people around you begin to notice and take notice of that? They begin to realize, hey, you know what? There's something different about them. They're not the same. They've, they've gone through some things and they've, they've, been, they've endured some long suffering and they're still making it. You know what? I remember they used to always be mad, but there's a peace about them now. Man, they, you know what they used to be? It says without drunkenness. You know what? They, they even stopped drinking. There's something different about them. You know, see, when, when you allow these things to take place and you allow that, that peace and that, and, that, and, that, and, and that long suffering to enter into your life, what happens is, is it begins to pour out to those around you. And people around you begin to see and say, you know what? I, I think I need some peace in my life. And you know what? Everywhere I go, there's no peace. But I remember her or him. There's peace in their life now. Because I remember when there was no peace in their life. I remember when their life was a mess. And there's peace in their life. I think I want some of that peace. See, the fruits of the Spirit allows, allows God to begin to minister to those around you just by using your life. I say, this, I say this many times. The Bible is just a book of stories. A bunch of people who did things for God, against God, fought God, lived for God, fought with God, fought for God. That's all the book is. Just a bunch of stories of historical historical people who live for God. Today, you're that Bible. People are looking at your life. You're the one that they're looking at and saying, you know what, that's, that's, that's the symbolization of God right there. I, I, I want to be a part of that. You are the living Bible to most people. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me he says he says I've been crucified with Christ and I don't, I don't longer live for myself anymore see to be a Christian the scripture doesn't need to be a part of your Bible. 
The scripture shouldn't just be a part of your Bible. It should be a part of your life. We need to live the life that Paul says. He says, he says, I know it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Can you imagine how much better things can be if we could say that? You know, it's not me. It's God who lives in me. I've lived, I have worked so hard to make this more evident in my life, and I'm still working on it because, you know what, I was so messed up to get to where I'm at today is a miracle in itself. And to move forward, I'm going to have to keep improving on this because, because it's not me who lives. It's Christ who lives in me. There's no way I can do the things that I do and, and be who I am if it wasn't God living in my life. I couldn't I couldn't be Pastor Ben. I couldn't I couldn't be here. I couldn't be preaching to these other places if, if it wasn't God living in me. I couldn't do that. My marriage wouldn't be successful today. We will be married uh, in September for 31 years. There'd be no way that would have been taking place if it wasn't Christ living in me. You see, it's it's God that lives in you that makes things possible. It's, you can't do it on your own. See, God has so much more for you. He has such a bigger plan for your life. And, and he wants to help you in so many things. That's why Paul says, you know what? Uh, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You are no longer of yourself, but you're of God now. If you are to follow Christ, we are to be crucified with him. To not be an observer of him. See, when Jesus went to the cross, there was a lot of people, man. All they did was watch. All they did was watch. They watched him get beat. They watched him drag the cross. They watched him get nailed. They got watched him put the crown of thorns on. They watched him hang there. And during all that, everybody was observing. But there was only one person that was paying attention. That was the, that was the thief next to him. And what happened with him? He accepted Jesus Christ on his on, 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 as he was dying. And Jesus says, he says, so sure, today you'll be with me and my father in paradise. And as Jesus Christ dies, he takes the man next to him with him to heaven. So we could be an observer and just watch what they did and watch our lives and watch the lives around us fall apart. Watch things get killed. Watch things fall apart. Watch things not happen. And we could just be an observer. Or we could be like Paul. It's not I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. See, when it's Christ who lives in you, the kingdom of heaven is promised. When it's Christ who lives in you, things change, lives change, those around you, people change. In Galatians 4 4. Galatians 4 4 through 7. It says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that he might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are you are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you no longer, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Right here it says, Abba, Father, and in the translation to that, the simple, the simple translation for modern modern language would be daddy like a like a child looking up and saying daddy it's such an intimate word such an intimate conversation when a child calls her daddy they say it with so much love and that's what the bible says is that that we've been adopted into christ that we can cry out abba father because he's now he's he, he it's a, it's an intimate relation he has for us but remember, Paul says, not, it's, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I like every about every eye closed for a moment. Just for a moment. I'm looking around. You know, God has so much for your life. You already did the hardest part. You showed up to church, you got it this morning. You got yourself all cleaned up. You came in and you sat down to listen. We could be an observer and just watch as Christ goes to the cross and as watch, watch as they kill Christ. Or we could be like the man that was, that was hanging next to him and say, you know what? 
this Christ does not deserve the things that he's got and give the opportunity to accept them. Today you're here and you're not saved. You maybe don't even know what that means. Well, right now you're feeling something in your heart. You know that tugging in your heart, that, that, that's, that's, that's Jesus Christ pulling at you saying, you know what? I see you, brother. I see you, sister. I see you, my son. I see you, my daughter. I want to help you. I want to be a part of your life. I know you stumbled. I know you made some mistakes, but you know what? I am here to forgive you because we're in this together for the long suffering. If that's you. You'd like to accept Jesus Christ in your heart. You can just raise your hand. You know, if in this place you're here, you know what? You won't be afraid. You know what? God is calling you. God has a plan for you. What we see in life, what we see goes around us, it's easy. It's easy. And I started this sermon asking, what are you willing to give up for your soul? What are you willing to sell your soul for? What's more important in this world than your soul? you like to accept Jesus Christ. You just raise your hand. Amen. I'm going to enjoy this service. We're going to all stand. We're going to sing a song. But if God spoke to you, Amen. These altars are open. I want to encourage you. I want you to come forward. Amen.